Chapter six of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter six The Hotel Corridor. One. As Bindle watched, a face peeped cautiously round the door of one of the bedrooms. It was a nervous, ascetic face, crowned by a mass of iron-gray hair that swept from left to right, and seemed to be held back from obliterating the weak but kindly blue eyes only by the determination of the right eyebrow. The face looked nervously to the right and to the left, and then, as if assured that no one was about, it was followed by a body clothed in carpet slippers, clerical trousers and coat, with a towel hanging over its shoulders. Parson muttered Bindle, as the figure slid cautiously along the corridor towards him. At the sight of Bindle emerging from the office of works, the clergyman started violently. C -c "'Can you direct me to the bathroom, please?' he inquired nervously. "'Ladies or gents, sir?' demanded Bindle. "'Ladies, uh, I mean gentlemen's!' The pale face flushed painfully, and the tide of hair refused to be held back longer and swept down entirely obliterating the right eye. "'Must have forgot his dressing-gown,' remarked Bindle, as the cleric disappeared round a corner, in the direction of the bathroom furthest from his own room, to which he had been directed. "'He must get over that nervousness of his,' was Bindle's excuse to himself as he returned to his room. He was just wiping his mouth on his coat-sleeve after draining the last drop of beer when he heard a suppressed scream from the corridor. He opened the door suddenly and was startled to find himself confronted by a woman of uncertain age in an elaborate rose-pink negligee and mob-cap, beneath which was to be seen a head suspiciously well coiffed for that hour of the morning. "'Oh, oh, oh!' she gasped as she entered the room, obviously laboring under some great emotion. "'Anything I can do, miss?' inquired Bindle respectfully, marvelling at the make-up that lay thick upon her withered cheeks. "'Looks like an apple what they forgot to pluck,' he commented inwardly. "'Anything I can do, miss?' "'There's, there's a m m man in my room,' she gasped. "'A what, miss?' inquired Bindle, in shocked surprise. "'A m m man!' "'Your husband, mum?' Bindle suggested diplomatically. "'I haven't got one,' she stuttered. "'Oh, it's dreadful! He's, he's in my bed, and he's bald, and he's got black whiskers!' Bindle whistled. "'How long's he been there, miss?' he inquired. "'I went to the bathroom, and, and he was there when I got back!' it's horrible dreadful and two tears that had hung pendulously in the corner of her eyes decided to make the plunge and ploughed their way through the make-up leaving brown trails like devastating armies well, what shall i do well since you arst me miss i shouldn't say anything about it replied bindle nothing about it nothing about a man being in my bed she was on the verge of hysterics what do you mean well miss hotels is funny places they might put him on the bill as an extra. You, you! What it was that Bindle most resembled, he did not wait to hear, but with great tact stepped out into the corridor, closing the door behind him. Somehow I thought things would happen, he murmured joyously. A few yards from him he saw the form of a fair-haired youth, immaculately garbed in a brilliantly hued silk kimono with red Turkish slippers and an eyeglass. He was gazing about him with an air of extreme embarrassment. "'Hi, you!' he called out. Bindle approached the young exquisite. "'There's... or someone got into my room by mistake. She's in my bed, too. What the devil have I to do? Awfully awkward, what?' Bindle grinned. The young man laughed nervously. He was feeling, "'A most awful rip, you know.' "'Some people gets all the luck,' remarked Bindle with a happy grin. "'A lady has just complained that she's found a man in her bed, bald head and black whiskers and all, and now here you are a-sayin' as there's a girl in yours. Has she a bald head and black whiskers, sir?' "'She's got fair hair and is rather pretty, and she's asleep. I stole out without waking her. Now I can't walk about in this kit all day.' He looked down at his elaborate deshabille. "'I must get my clothes, you know. How the deuce did she get there? I was only away twenty minutes.' Bindle scratched his head. "'You're in a difficult sort of old, sir. I'm afraid it's like once when I went to bathing and the dog went to sleep on me trousers and growled and snapped when I tried to get him away. I had to go home looking like an islander.' "'Look here,' remarked the young man. "'I'll give you a sovereign to go and fetch my things. 
I'll dress in a bathroom. He was a really nice young man, one who has a mother and sisters and remembers the circumstance. I'm afraid Mrs. Bindle, my wife, sir, my name's Bindle, Joseph Bindle, wouldn't like it, sir. She's very particular as Mrs. B. I think you'd better go in there, indicating the office of works, and I'll call the chambermaid. Oh, that's a brainy idea, remarked the youth, brightening. I never thought of that. Bindle opened the door and the youth entered. There was a shrill scream from the pink negligee. It's all right, miss. This gentleman's like yourself. Sort of got hisself mixed up. There's a lady in his room, <coughs> in his bed, too. Kind of family coach going on this morning, seems to me. The youth blushed rosily and was just on the point of stammering apologies for his garb when a tremendous uproar from the corridor interrupted him. Bindle had purposely left the door ajar, and through the slit he had a moment previously seen the clergyman disappear precipitately through one of the bedroom doors. It was from this room that the noise came. Mon Dieu! shrieked a female voice. Il se baton! A moi! A moi! There were hoarse mutterings and the sound of blows. Here, you look arter each other, Bindle cried. It's murder this time! And he sped down the corridor. He entered number 21 to find locked together in a deadly embrace the clergyman and a little bald-headed man in pajamas. In the bed was a figure, Bindle mentally commended its daintiness, rising up from a foam of frillies and shrieking at the top of her voice, silly things what wasn't even words, as Bindle afterwards told Mrs. Hearty. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, il sera fui. Regular fightin' parson, muttered Bindle as he strove to part the man. If he don't stop a bumpin' his head on the floor, he'll break it. Here, stop it, sir. You mustn't use his head as if it was a coconut and you wanted the milk come orf bindle had seized the clergyman from behind and was pulling with all his strength as he might at the collar of a bellicose bull terrier come orf yer mustn't do this sort of thing in an hotel i'm surprised at you sir a clergyman too half choking the clergyman rose to his feet and strove to brush the flood of hair from his eyes his opponent seized the opportunity and flew back to bed, where he sat trying to staunch the blood that flowed from his nose and hurling defiance at his enemy. "'What's it all about?' inquired Bindle. "'I, I came back from my bath and found this man in my bed with a—, a... "'Ma femme!' shrieked the little Frenchman. "'Is it not that we have slept here every night for—' "'Ush, sir, ush!' rebuked Bindle over his shoulder with a grin. "'We don't talk like that in England.' sort of lost your way and got in the wrong room bindle suggested to the clergyman he rushed at me and kicked me in the er er stum er well he kicked me and, and i i forget and i i of course you did sir anyone had a done the same then to the frenchman bindle remarked severely you didn't ought to have kicked him him a clergyman too fancy kicking a clergyman in the well where you kicked him what's the number of your room sir he inquired turning to the clergyman twenty-one see it's on the door bindle looked there was twenty-one clear enough what's your number sir he asked the frenchman think to quite now don't you go a-usin none of them words for a clergyman what's your number that's what i'm arstin twenty-four ving quart well said bindle with decision you're in the wrong room Miss impossible cried the frenchman we have been here all night is it not so cherie he turned to his wife for corroboration bindle had no time to enter further into the dispute suddenly a fresh disturbance broke out further along the corridor what the devil do you mean by this outrage sir an angry and imperious voice was demanding what the devil do you with a hasty word to the clergyman who now looked thoroughly ashamed of himself and a gentle push in the direction of the office of works bindle trotted off to the scene of the new disturbance he heard another suppressed scream from the pink negligee betokening the entry of the clergyman what the devil do you mean by entering my room a tall irate man with the army stamped all over him dressed in pajamas with a monocle firmly wedged in his left eye was fiercely eyeing a smaller man in a bathrobe not content with having got into my room but damn sir you must needs try and get into my trousers what the devil do you mean by it bindle looked along the corridor appreciatively looks like a shipwreck at night it do he remarked to the chambermaid that's my room said the man in the bathrobe confound you was the reply this is my room and i'll prosecute you for libel 
my room is number eighteen responded the other and i left my wife there half an hour ago he pointed to the figures on the door in proof of his contention the man in the monocle looked at the door and a puzzled expression passed over his face damn he exploded my room is number fifteen but i certainly slept in that room all night he darted inside and reappeared a moment after with his trousers in his hand here are my trousers to prove it are these your trousers the man in the bathrobe confessed that they were not that seems to prove it all right sir remarked bindle who had come up a man don't sleep in a different room from his trousers leastways unless he's a islander similar disturbances were taking place along the corridor the uproar began to attract visitors from other corridors and soon the whole place was jammed with excited guests in attire so varied and insufficient that one lady who had insisted on her husband accompanying her to see what had happened immediately sent him back to his room that his eyes might not be outraged by the lavish display of ankles and bare arms the more nervous among the women guests had immediately assumed fire to be the cause of the disturbance and thinking of their lives rather than of modesty and decorum had rushed precipitately from their rooms it might be a turkish bath for all the clothes they're wearin bindle whispered to the exquisite youth who with his two fellow guests had left the office of works ain't women funny shapes when they ain't braced up the youth looked at bindle reproachfully he had not yet passed from that period when women are mysterious and wonderful at the doors of several of the rooms heated arguments were in progress as to who was the rightful occupant inside they were all practically the same that was part of the scheme of the hotel the man with the monocle was still engaged in a fierce altercation with the man in the bathrobe who was trying to enter number eighteen my wife's in there cried the man in the bathrobe fiercely at this moment the deputy manager appeared a man whose face had apparently been modelled with the object of expressing only two emotions benignant servility to the guests and overbearing contempt to his subordinates as if by common consent the groups broke up and the guests hastened towards him his automatic smile seemed strangely out of keeping with the crisis he was called upon to face information and questions poured in upon him there's a girl in my bed there's a man in my room somebody's got into my room is it fire it's a public scandal this man has tried to take my trousers look here i can't go about in this kit i left my wife in room eighteen and i can't find her i shall write to the times i protest against this indecent exhibition the more questions and remarks that poured down upon him the more persistently the deputy manager smiled he looked about him helplessly hitherto in the whole of his experience all that had been necessary for him to do was to smile and promise attention and bully his subordinates here was a new phase he wished the manager had not chosen this weekend for a trip to brighton the eyes of the deputy manager roved round him like those of a trapped animal seeking some channel of escape by a lucky chance they fell upon the fireman who was just preparing to go off duty the deputy manager beckoned to him the smile had left his face he was now talking to a subordinate what is the meaning of this he inquired the fireman looked up and down the corridor he had been at the hotel over ten years that is since its opening and knew every inch of the place from the crowd of figures he glanced along the corridor he was a man of few words somebody's been having a joke the numbers all have been changed that pointing to number eighteen is number fifteen and that pointing to number twenty four is number twenty one at the fireman's words angry murmurs and looks were exchanged each of the guests suspected the others of the joke the fireman who was a man of much resource as well as of few words quickly solved the problem by obtaining some envelopes and putting on the doors the right numbers within a quarter of an hour every guest had found either his clothes his lost one or both and the corridor was once more deserted well murmured bindle as he stepped out of the service lift i suppose they won't be wantin me again so i'll go home and get a bit of sleep and he walked off whistling gaily whilst the firemen searched everywhere for the one man the deputy manager most desired to see two on the monday evening following the hotel episode mr and mrs bindle were seated at supper bindle had been unusually conversational he was fortunate in having that morning obtained employment at a well-known stores he was once more a pantechnicon man 
King Richard is hisself again, he would say, when he passed from a temporary alien employment to what he called the legitimate. He had felt it desirable to explain to Mrs. Bindle the cause of his leaving the splendid hotel. She had seen nothing at all humorous in it, and Bindle had studiously refrained from any mention of women being in the corridors. He had just drawn away from the table and was sitting smoking his pipe by the fire when there was a loud knock at the outer door. He looked up expectantly. Mrs. Bindle went to the door. From the passage he heard a familiar voice inquiring for him. It was Sanders, the foreman, who followed Mrs. Bindle into the room. He made no response to Bindle's pleasant, "'Good evening.' "'Do you know what you've done?' inquired Sanders aggressively. "'You lost me my ruddy job. You did it a-purpose, and I've come to kill yer.' "'Ain't you had enough of burying?' inquired Bindle significantly. "'Burying your mother on Saturday, and now you wants to kill your old pal on Monday.' The menacing attitude of the foreman had no effect on Bindle. He had a great heart and would cheerfully have stood up to a man twice the size of Sanders. The foreman made a swift movement in the direction of Bindle. "'You stuttering, bespattered God!' Mrs. Bindle, seeing that trouble was impending, had armed herself with a very wet and very greasy dishcloth, which she had thrown with such accurate aim as to catch the foreman full in the mouth. "'You dirty hound!' she vociferated. "'Coming into a Christian home and using that foul language! You dirty hound! I'll teach you!' Mrs. Bindle's voice rose in a high crescendo. She looked about her for something with which to follow up her attack, and saw her favourite weapon, the broom. "'You dirty mouth tyke!' she cried, working herself into a fury. "'You blaspheming son of Belial! Take that!' Crack came the handle of the broom on the foreman's head. Without waiting to observe the result, and with a dexterous movement, she reversed her weapon and charged the foreman, taking him full in the middle with the broom itself. In retreating, he stumbled over the coal scuttle and sat down with a suddenness that made his teeth rattle. Bindle watched the episode with great interest. Never had he so approved of Mrs. Bindle as at that moment. Like a St. George threatening the dragon, she stood over the foreman. "'Now then, will you say it again?' she inquired menacingly. There was no response. "'Say, God forgive me!' she ordered. "'Say it!' she insisted, seeing reluctance in the foreman's eye. "'Say it, or I'll eat your on your dirty mouth with this ear broom. I'm a daughter of the Lord, I am. Are you going to say it, or shall I change your face for you?' "'God forgive me,' mumbled the foreman, in a voice entirely devoid of contrition. Mrs. Bindle was satisfied. "'Now up you're getting off your go,' she said. "'I won't hit you again if you don't talk, but never you think to come a-using such words in a Christian home again.' The foreman sidled towards the door warily. When he was within reach of it, he made a sudden dive and disappeared. Bindle regarded his wife with approval as she returned from banging the door after him. Oh, "'I didn't know,' he remarked, "'that they taught you that sort of thing at chapel. Oh, "'I likes a religion that lets you do a bit in the knockabout business. "'Can't understand you and already belong to the same flock of sheep. "'Rummy thing, religion,' he soliloquized, as he applied a match to his pipe. Seems to have its bank holidays, same as work. End of chapter six. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Shaggybark.blogspot.com.